Hey there, Dengas Chu here. Today's video by popular demand is gonna be on carburetor tuning. When it comes to tuning the carburetors on an outboard, I think of it as a series of individual steps. Now, step one I have to say is fix everything else. There's no point going through this process if you've got trouble with spark, your carburetors are dirty, whatever. So really this is the final step. You've got everything running as nicely as you can and this is sort of the icing on the cake. The next step after that is adjusting the idle mixture screws till we get essentially the fastest idle we can, trying to get them running at their best air to fuel mixture, best, best ratio. Then once we've done that, we may need to adjust the idle itself, the overall idle, probably bring the idle back down once the, once the mixtures have been set correctly. Once we've done that, we're gonna hook up this carburetor balancer, a little vacuum gauge, and we're gonna adjust the individual butterfly valves, the throttles, so that we're getting equal vacuum in the inlet manifold for all three cylinders in this case. So I'll just take this for a quick run, we'll warm it up, then we'll pull into the pontoon, get the cowling off, and start the process. Engine's nice and warm now, so I'm gonna whip off the cowling. While the motor's still off, I'll just come in and show you these mixture screws, and then we'll have a go at adjusting them. These screws here at the top, towards the intake manifold, they're your mixture screws. So this is the one for the first carb, this is for the middle carb, and this is the one for the bottom carb. Now these ones are fuel mixture screws. So the more we wind them out, it's like a tap or a washer and a tap. So as you pull it out, you're opening an aperture, you're letting more fuel in. The reason we know these are fuel uh, mixture screws is because they're at the engine side or the intake side of the carburetor. If they're at the air box side here, they would be air screws. The other way we know is by the shape of them. I'll pull one of them out and I'll show you. You can see here the screw's got a spring that goes over it. And then it's got an O-ring at the very end here. But the important thing is that it's a real needle screw. Because it comes to a really fine tapered point, that's also what tells us this is a fuel mixture screw. So I'm gonna pop this back in. And we'll find a default setting to start with. If you wanna take one of these screws out and return it to the same position you found it in, the trick to that is to, before you wind it out, to wind it in and count how many half turns it takes before it bottoms out. So in this case, I might turn it one, two, three, four, say four and a half half turns, so two and a quarter. And once it bottoms out, I can take it back out and then I know how far out it was to begin with. I'm not so worried about that now because I'm actually gonna be resetting these completely, so I'm going to wind them all the way in. Do this gently because you don't want to damage the needle or the tip of the needle on the screw. So they're all lightly seated now. And now I'm going to back them all out the same amount and start the motor up. When it comes to finding the starting position for all these screws, Often the service manual for a motor will tell you what is the right sort of starting position. It is true that a carburetor good condition, a brand new motor probably has a, a, a range you can set it to that's pretty close to, to correct. And obviously you need to start somewhere. But don't ever let anyone tell you that there is a correct position for these screws to be in. I mean, there is in the sense that in any given time for any given motor, there is a correct position, but it can't just be a fixed number. If it was, they wouldn't be adjustable. It's that simple. You know, they'd just be locked off and that'd be it. But knowing a reasonable figure is a good way to start this tuning. And also if you've got an output that's running terribly, just have a look what they're set to. Sometimes you'll find they've been adjusted by people and they're all over the shop. One's half a turn out, one's 12 turns out, you know. So getting them all to a, a reasonable baseline, it's not a bad first step. In this case, I'm gonna turn them all out, uh, let's say two and a half turns, so five half turns. Uh, things like that are pretty common. I actually did, guilty, mean to look it up for this motor before I came out here, but I forgot, sorry. I'll put it in the description when I find out what it was supposed to be. But I tend to prefer to be a little bit lean, a little bit further in to start. That way, 
you can start to come out and, and hear the revs change as you go. It's a little bit like tuning a guitar, for example. You might start with a particular string below the note so you can sort of come up to the note and hear it more clearly as you, as you arrive at the correct point. The principle is pretty much the same. So what I'll do now is I'll go take all those screws that I wound all the way in. I'll wind them all out. I think I'll actually just do four half turns, to be honest. Start a bit lean. We'll start the motor up. And then one by one, we're going to start winding them out a little bit further and see whether the revs go up or go down. What we're looking to find is the point where the revs are their highest. That's where the motor's running at the best mixture. It's running as strongly as, as it can. If you start to wind it out too far, the revs might rise as you go from being too lean to this correct mixture. And then if you start getting too rich, the revs will actually start to drop off. So once you get to this highest point, you can even kind of back it off a little bit just in case you come a bit too far. So we'll set them out four half turns each, or two turns, fire it up, and we'll start with the top <coughs> one and work our way down. Yeah. So top one, just gonna do one, two, three, four half turns out. Middle one, one, two, three, four half turns out. The bottom. Oh, sorry about that fender noise. Bottom one, one, two, three, four half turns. All right, let's fire it up and hear what it sounds like. I'm going to start with the top cylinder now, and I'm just going to wind it out quarter turn at a time, count on my head just so I know roughly where it's at and see whether the revs are going up or going down. That actually sounds like it's getting worse to me. Sometimes for confirmation as well, you can just start winding it all the way in. So you can hear that's quite bad now. Half a turn, so I, I wound that all the way in and it almost stalled. I'll do that again, so that's, that's bottomed out entirely. That's half a turn out. That's a whole turn out. That's a turn and a half. To be honest with you, I think that two turns was almost spot on where we started. It certainly doesn't come up at all with that fourth turn. I'm comfortable to leave that at the four half turns, the two turns out that we started as our default position. Now this middle one, I might actually start by winding it in just to see if it noticeably goes down. Yeah, it's definitely running a little bit rough there. It's actually more something I can feel through the screwdriver than the sound of it, to be honest with you. So I'll go back out. Actually, I'm gonna go all the way in. You can probably hear that now it's running pretty badly. Come out half a turn, one turn, one and a half, two. You hear the reds just came up a little bit more then. Two and a half actually rose a little bit more. Dropping between two and a half and three does actually seem to make a little bit of a difference. So back to three. Back to three and a half. I'm not hearing a huge difference, so I'm going to leave it at three. Now we'll try the bottom one. So once again, if I wind it all the way in, 
clearly it's running worse. Go half, one, one and a half, two, that's two and a half at the moment. The jump from two and a half to three does actually seem to make it idle better or faster. Let's go to three and a half. Three and a half is even more again. Four. I'm going to go all the way back in because I've actually lost count. Purely because I want to know what they're set at. So, half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half. Three is definitely more. I'm going to run with three and a half on the bottom. So now to me, that's got all those carburetor mixture screws set to be the fastest idle I can get it to. I don't think it's a coincidence that the bottom carburetor is running the leanest, so I've had to richen it up the most, because quite often you'll see this trend where the, because of the way the carburetor is drained, that you end up with more junk in the bottom carburetor and they sort of progressively get cleaner as they go up. If you get a huge difference between these carburetors, you really could say, well, what I need to do is clean this bottom carburetor. I've had to richen it up so much, it's probably got a bit of dirt in the idle jet. But for the sake of today's video, we'll push on. So I think we had this at two, uh, sort of two and a half, and then almost four for the bottom one. Okay, so now what we've done is we've adjusted all the mixture screws to get the fastest idle we can. That idle now is too high. You could easily put a taco on this, one of those sort of optical ones or clamp on, whatever you want to do. But you can hear it pretty clearly. Now the reason I say this is too high isn't because the manual says 800 RPM or whatever. What you'll find is the ideal range for your idle to be at is where your motor doesn't stall. That's kind of obvious, I guess. But you also want it to be at a point where when you put it into gear, it's not a really sort of violent clunk. The reason you want your idle low is to protect the gearbox essentially. So I now need to drop that idle back down so that I can go into gear smoothly without damaging my gearbox. So I'll just start it up and we're tied onto the wall so it won't really go anywhere. But I'll just put it in gear and I'll, hopefully you can kind of hear what I'm talking about when the idle's too high. I'm not sure you can. You get the idea though. If you get a real thud, uh, a particularly, I don't know, it's really hard to describe, but a, a slightly sharper sound, the boat jolts a little bit, you know it's way too high. So what I'm gonna do now is show you the screw to bring the overall idle speed of the motor back down to a normal range. Here you can see the throttle linkage coming along from the forward controls. Then you can see this unit here links all the carburetors together. And in here, there's a screw that stops those butterfly valves closing all the way when this linkage is in neutral. So what I need to do is push that screw in to increase the revs or pull it out to decrease the revs. So what I'm gonna do now is pull this out until I get to what I think sounds like a comfortable idle speed, one where the gearbox isn't gonna take damage, but the motor's not gonna stall. was probably a quarter of a turn.
That's probably about right. As well as looking for a point where the idle is low enough to be kind to your gearbox. And when I say you want it to be high enough not to stall, but you also find there's a point where motors are a bit smoother. They just sound a little bit more in balance. So trust your instincts a little bit when it comes to where a motor sounds like it's a bit out of balance, it's really a bit spluttery. You'll hear it when it starts to smooth out a bit. I'm going to leave it like this for now and then we're going to move on to uh, doing the balancing, the synchronisation process using the vacuum gauge. Petrol motors have a certain amount of vacuum inside the intake manifold and that's because the pistons go down trying to draw air into the cylinders but the throttle plate is closed which means that it can't readily suck air in and so you end up with this sort of partial vacuum and what this gauge does is lets you measure what level of vacuum, what the actual air pressure is inside each of the intake manifold runners. As a matter of interest, diesel motors don't have any meaningful intake manifold vacuum because they don't have throttle plates, they just adjust the amount of fuel injected in. They're almost always at wide open throttle and it's blocking it off. It's essentially choking it, what the throttle plate does, that makes this vacuum build up. Now, the more a plate opens, the less vacuum there is. You never have more vacuum, essentially, than at idle when the plates are closed. The most vacuum you'll ever have is if you run the motor at high revs and then really quickly kind of choke it off. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take out some little, little plugs that close off open ports on the intake manifold runners. And we're gonna put some of, see how organized I am, hang on. We're gonna put some of these so where we take that screw out, we're going to put these little tubes in. I'm really hoping, I haven't checked once again, complete lack of preparation, that the thread on this is the same. I know with the Yamaha, I think it was one mil larger, so I had to buy separate ones for the Yamaha. I think the Hondas are standard. I think they're six mil maybe. If they're not, we're continuing this tomorrow. Once I've got these into the intake manifold, the vacuum line from the gauge, simply goes over the top of this tube and it's all sealed off. We can fire the motor up and start getting some readings. Because vacuum's not constant, it's, it's because of the motion of uh, the cylinder, the piston going up and down, you get these little valves that you can close off to stop your sort of needle bounce. So we may have to adjust those a little bit too, but I'll show you that when we get it running. So here's our three carburetors. And then here are the intake runners. And these screws here, see if I can find one, there we go. They plug little holes in the intake runners. So we're gonna take those screws out and that's where we're gonna put these little brass pipes in. Uh, in this case, they're just a Phillips head screw. Now you get to watch me take these out and drop them in the water. Presuming they do come out. All right, there's one. Out of interest, if I was to fire this motor up now, it would be running lean because it would have what's called a vacuum leak. Normally the air fuel ratio is uh, metered by the carburetor, but in this case, the carburetor would be having the correct air fuel mixture coming past the Venturi, and then it would have extra air added through that vacuum leak, through those open ports. So I'll just fire it up and we'll see what that sounds like. So hopefully that gives you an idea about how sort of catastrophic a vacuum leak can be. You think, why won't my boat start? If it's got a leaking gasket, so a gasket between the carburetor and the inlet manifold or the inlet manifold and the block, you'll have the exact same effect. All right, let's now compare those screws to the tubes we've got. So we're in luck. The screws that came out of the ports on the intake manifold are the exact same thread pitch and diameter as those tubes we've got. So I can now just go and thread those tubes into the holes and hook the gauge up. These tubes have got a little O-ring around the base of them, so I'm gonna make sure they're wound all the way in so they seal properly around here. That's one, I'll just go do the other two.
This is the three tubes now and the three carburetors. This kit comes with two short and two long, which I believe is because they're predominantly marketed towards motorcycles where you have inside carburetors. I don't believe the length makes any real difference other than accessibility to the carburetor. Someone might better comment if they know better, um, but I don't think all these lengths in the tube need to be identical to get accurate reading. Next steps, just to connect the gauge up. Just making sure these are tight. And I'm simply gonna go top cylinder, middle cylinder, bottom cylinder. If you're ever wondering why I didn't do a video on this earlier, it's because I lost the other tube here and the Yamaha was a four cylinder. I know it's a lame excuse, but it's actually the reason. So here we are now, we've got our little brass tubes in, the vacuum lines coming off to the gauge here, and we've got our top, middle and bottom cylinders. Now I'm going to find somewhere to secure this, I might even just put a cable tie through these holes in the top here so it doesn't end up in the drink. And I'm going to open these little valves here completely and I'll close them off until the needles stop really bouncing if we need to. So I'll get that cable tie, I'll start the motor and we'll come back and look at the gauges. So you can see here, provided we don't pinch these cables off, you can start to see the bounce of these needles with each cycle of the piston. So you're seeing the vacuum change as the piston's going up and down. So I'm just gonna close these little valves a smidge until the needle bounce stops. And then we'll start to get a clearer idea of where we're at. And I've got to say, all these cylinders look pretty even. So what I'll do is I'll start adjusting the butterfly valves. I'll show you how you do that. And we'll bring them out of sync, and then we'll bring them back into sync. Here before, we adjusted this screw here, which adjusted all three. So we can't actually adjust this one individually. If we adjust this screw, we adjust all three. But here, we've got a screw here and a screw here. And you can tell they're the right screws because this is the pivot point for the throttle plate. So we know that this is the screw that affects the throttle plate. You can actually see also somebody's put some sort of like yellow paint Loctite type thing. So they've obviously balanced this at some stage, which is why it's nicely set, and then locked it off and said this is good. So we're going to open these up, which will if we open them up, we'll close the throttle plate. If we push them in, we'll open the throttle plate and we'll start to see what effect that has on our gauge. So if I adjust the screw on the top carburetor, wind it out. As I push this screw, you're hearing a fluctuation. That's just because I'm pushing the whole throttle mechanism. Ignore that for now. But if I wind it out, now you'll see this one has much less vacuum than the other two. So my goal is to get all these the same. Now because I can't easily adjust the bottom cylinder on its own, what I'm not gonna do is adjust these screws until these two match this one. So this one's a smidge above this line which is the, uh, so let me have a look here. So that looks like it's sitting at about 11 inches or just a little bit less, so like 10.9 inches. So I'm now gonna make this one so that that needle drops just a little bit. This one here is sort of actually sitting on 11 now. Come over, they're pretty even. This is the one I adjusted down. So I'll bring this one up. They're pretty sensitive, so it only takes the tiniest turn. 
So I think that's pretty close. So they're all pretty even. So in this case, that first cylinder, when I wound this screw out, the vacuum was dropping. When I wind it in, the vacuum's increasing. Obviously, it's not, it's not rocket science. If you wind it one way, it's not going the way you want, wind it the other way. So here you can see we've got 11, and a, 11 inches on the bottom carburetor, 11 inches on the middle carburetor, and closer to 12 on the top one that I've been sort of messing with. So I'm just gonna wind that out a tiny bit and see if we can bring that down to 11 as well. Once again, those revs were just climbing because I was pushing on the screw head. It's got nothing to do with the adjustment I'm making. Still a little bit high. Just trying to make really small changes. Now, once you've made a change, it's really good just to sort of blip the throttle a little bit and see what they settle back to. Here I still think this top cylinder's settling too high. So they didn't quite settle down to 11 again yet, they're dropping, but the top one's still noticeably higher than the other two. So out of interest, we've now got to the point where there's some yellow paint on the casing and yellow paint on the spring. So that's obviously its original position. And it's pretty close to right. You've got to be careful to look at these pretty straight on, otherwise you get a little bit of parallax error. But I think this actually needs to go in a tiny smidge. So all three of those look pretty close now. So I'm pretty comfortable with those settings now. Obviously somebody had balanced this at some stage before I got the motor, which is great. It was always running quite nicely, so it doesn't really surprise me. But when you aren't doing this job, I guess the point I'm trying to make is if they're wildly out, great, you're gonna make a, a huge difference to how the motor runs, particularly how it idles. But don't go chasing that last 1%. You know, there's so much play in the springs. They're all mechanical linkages. You know, you, you'll never get it perfect. You're never gonna get this really direct one-to-one -one between you making a change and getting a permanent change that's exactly what you want. You might get it right on, you blip the throttle, it doesn't come back to where, you, where it was originally, that kind of thing. So, d don't agonize over it. The next really important step is to take those tubes out and put these screws back in securely because we don't want a vacuum leak. When I had all three out, you saw it didn't even start. So it goes to show how catastrophic a vacuum leak can be. A small leak will cause um, like a fluctuating idle, all sorts of different symptoms. Um, but putting these back in properly, just avoid that altogether. So to recap, fix everything else first. All those gross problems, you know, water in the fuel, dodgy spark plugs, dodgy spark plug leads, dirty carburetors, you, you've got to sort all that out first. This is never going to really compensate for that. It is true the mixture screw can compensate slightly for an idle jet that's a bit blocked and running a bit lean, but ignore that and just, just fix everything else first. Then once you've got your mixture screws set right, you should have a nice, strong, fast idle. Drop the idle back down to a sensible level and then go and make sure your throttle valves are all balanced and you're getting equal vacuum in all those ports. So that really is the process. So I hope this video helps you if you are trying to tune up the carburetors on your output. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please rate, comment and subscribe and I'll catch you next time. See ya.